So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. One and all and all in one. And there you go. Four and five. <laughs> Let's rise if you so desire and create in me a clean heart, oh God. Just wait. Just 
wait an hour and we will be here. So that's how you'll know. Um, I'll knock on her door and ask for coffee. You can knock on my door. <laughs> I might still be in my robe an hour early. <laughs> Maybe I'll be prepared next Monday. No, I'm kidding, I won't be. Time change Saturday. Um, today is a day of fasting and prayer for our nation, our leaders, our upcoming election. Um, you know, we can fast from many things. It, it doesn't have to be food. We can um, fast from our thoughts, thoughts that lead us uh, farther from the Lord. We can fast from uh, social media. We can fast from football. <laughs> we can fast from uh, spending time in front of the TV. There, I'll save that. I'll just lump it all in. We can fast from many things, including... Uh, food. The point of fasting is to make us uncomfortable and to draw us closer to the Lord. That's the point of it. Is it's not enjoyable. It is to cause us to have some sort of a physical reminder to, uh, to pray, to reach out to Jesus, to know that we can't do this on our own. So um, that is a time for today. If, it's, if you've already had breakfast, you really can start now. It, it's okay. That we're not we don't have hard and fast rules, so uh, maybe you just fast from one meal today. And um, the point is we really want to spend time praying for our nation and um, just everything happening right now. We have some prayer requests and praises. We need to continue to pray for Carol. Um, uh, Vicki's requested prayer for her dad and brother and her niece. Paco needs prayer. He has an unknown shoulder-ish injury that we don't know the extent of that yet. So um, his collarbone's not broken. That's a praise. What we don't know is um, if there are any underlying issues. We'll know that. You can go check that out next Sunday. Um, so we will be doing that. I'm going to continue to pray for Linda. Do you have any update on Linda? She is very new. And um, turned herself into an institution in council for 30 days. Okay. So I have no idea. Okay. So we will pray for Linda. Um, she is seeking help and um, looking at ways to make sure she doesn't have self harm, get some tools under her belt. So let's continue to pray for Linda as she um, is just seeking help for um, her health. She needs our prayers. Continue to pray for our teachers. There are many, many avenues in which our teachers need prayer right now. So please continue to pray for them. I do have um, a note here that I'd like to read. We're really glad to have um, Charlene with us this morning. <clears throat> Um, this week we received a note from her, and I'm going to read it to you because it's to our Whitney friends' family. I want to thank you all for your prayers for me and my family at the loss of my dear husband of 62 years, and for all the cards and food sent to my family and me. Homer would have um, been most grateful, too, and he would have loved the food. <laughs> He was a good man and will be greatly missed by his many friends and family. Thank you again. Love you all, Shirley and family. We love you too, and you are correct in that Homer is greatly missed. Um, thank you to those of you who have already um, honored and sent a memorial in for Homer. Uh, some people we don't know have mailed in, and I'll be getting that to you as well. Um, but this is, you know, first Sunday back is always hard. There's a year of first for many in our church family this year. So let's continue to pray for um, all of us as we deal with loss and navigate the waves of emotions that come uh, throughout the day that can change with the hour and to know that that's okay. So we're glad that you're here this morning with us, all of you. Roy, would you... Please come and share about the multiplication conference for us.
You know, it's been, uh, well, is that hot? It's been rather interesting with all the COVID stuff, you know, and the transition in church, you know, being able to meet together and those kind of things. But besides all that, besides COVID, and besides the craziness of the world and everything, do you know that God is still at work? Amen. Amen. You know, and right now, God is calling us into a movement of multiplication, a movement of planting churches, of being active in spreading the gospel and continuing to do so. Because even today, although we can't all meet together, some of you are meeting with us online, and some of us are meeting here corporately, but we're all still doing the gospel work. We're all still, still doing the kingdom building, right? Well, upcoming is in November 11th through the 13th is the Church International Church Multiplication Conference. This is a friends conference. It's going to be literally, we thought 16 time zones, but because of the time change next week, it actually becomes 17 time zones oh, that we'll be in. So, an incredible, incredible thing. But I, I wanted you to uh, be encouraged about that. Our main speaker is Ed Stetzer. And I have a short little video I want to play for you, real quick, just so you can hear from Ed himself. For those of you online, we'll be posting the link for you to be able to watch the same video as well. So, Javier, would you play that video for us, please? And it is for such a time as this. You know, church multiplication takes all kinds of people to make all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. And the thing about church multiplication is you don't have to be a missionary yourself. You don't have to be a church planner yourself. But we can all be a part of it, right? And so we're inviting you as Northwest Shirley Meeting. We want to take an active role in developing a culture of multiplication in Northwest Shirley Meeting and Friends Churches, which is our, includes our church. Amen? And with that, our Board of Local Outreach has offered to sponsor 50% of your registration fee. It's $30 to register for the conference online. It's a three-day event. Um, we may have some local watch parties in some of the area churches around here if you want to be a part of that as well. But if you register, and there's going to be a link for you to be able to click that you're a part of the Northwest Yearly Meeting, and Board of Local Outreach is going to pay 50% of your registration. The reason we want to do that, so it makes it $15 to participate in the multiplication conference where everybody can have a part and a role in helping develop church multiplication, church planting in Northwest Shirley Meeting, maybe even in our own neighborhoods. So with that exciting, exciting news, we hope you register and join us for the Church Multiplication Conference November 11th through the 13th. Thank you. Question for you. What if I... She didn't say there was a quiz. What if I am not good with this technology thing and... I need help registering. What do I do? So you can come to us here at the church as part of, part, part of our community. Us means him. <laughs> yeah, you can come to me. I'll help get you registered and make sure all that happens for you. If you, if you struggle with technology or anything like that as well, um, we can get you registered. Also, if you um, are planning on attending one of the local watch parties, you can actually register at the watch party at that time as well. But we prefer you register in advance. We're trying to get a number um, of the people that are involved. Uh, again, this is an incredible movement. We're talking 17 time zones around the world, all being involved in this international conference. And so there's multiple layers to this whole dynamic. And to see this many people coming together to focus on creating a culture of church planting and church multiplication and sharing the gospel is incredible. It's unheard of at this time. So. Yeah, I have another question. Um, is there any benefit to me registering early? Like financially or anything like that? Is there a reason why? Is there a deadline? <laughs> <laughs> so, there, there is. It makes it easier for you to get your 50% supplement from the Board of Local Outreach from Northwest Yearly Meeting if you register early. If you do it on site, you, you, will, you will get it. You'll only pay the half, but it's complicated in the system. Does that make sense? Yes. It benefits it benefits the system and it benefits. Doesn't us also to the price increase starting November first? It does increase November first. So if we register by next Saturday, the thirty first, our price still is lower even with the half. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you so much. If we have any other questions, we will come to you. Feel free to reach out. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other announcements that I have missed this that I have missed this morning?
Is it the one that slid off the edge? Huh? I didn't take it home with me. I know. No. <laughs> my book's right here. My, I haven't even stuck our chest in. So okay. we don't have to Ah, the mystery of the missing go. music. Yeah. In the meantime, we're going to sing to the music we do have. Please rise. Let it Well, good morning, my friends. Good morning. Good morning. Put my mask away. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to check the time because I told Joy my sermon's pretty long. I've been working on it two weeks. I decided God had a lot for me to say. told Joy how many pages it was, and she goes, ooh, you better cut some of that out. <laughs> so I did, but it's still long. But it's good. It's good. Amen? You preach it. 
So we're continuing in our series on the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 22, 22 through 23, it gives a list of characteristics that will grow in a person's life if the Spirit is present and allowed to do His work in us. This is what people look like as they become more like Jesus. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And today as we're looking at the sixth one in this list, goodness, it's a good thing. Good. It's a pretty flexible word, good. We use it in a lot of different ways. If I've got my hair all in place and my outfit's on point, I can look in the mirror and say, man, I look good. <laughs> there you go. If I'm playing basketball and I hit five three-pointers, oh, I could be running back down the court saying, man, I'm good. <laughs> if I'm sitting in the fellowship hall at a potluck, luncheon, and somebody walks by with a plate full of extra pieces of cake, I might hold my hand up and say, no thanks, I'm good. <laughs> okay, probably not. <laughs> we use the word good in lots of different ways. Food tastes good, TV shows and movies are good. Someone who's in, who is confident at their job is very good, like a very good doctor. We can have good times, good feelings, and good friends, and they can all go together. As I looked the word in the, as I looked at the word in the Bible, I found that it could be equally flexible. It's a word the Bible uses a lot. Most of the time, the word is used to describe God. As the saying goes, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Amen. God is the standard of goodness. He is also the source of good in the world. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. It says so in James chapter 1 verse 17. But when the word is applied to us, as it is in the fruit of the spirit passage, it can have a range of meaning. As I looked at the resources on goodness this week, I found people talking about lots of different things. One of them was integrity. Good people are people who, you, who are the same in one situation as they are in another. They're always the same person. What about purity? Good people are, good, are people who have their hearts in the right place. And what about behavior? Good people are people who do good things. As I look at the word in, in scripture, it's that third one, good people are people who do good things. That stuck out to me. Let me give you some examples. In Titus chapter 3, verse 1, remind people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and be ready to do whatever is good. The Apostle Paul had a, had a great deal to say about the importance of Christians being people who do good. As he taught Titus how to pastor a church, he urged him to challenge the people to devote themselves to doing good. Not just being good, but doing good. There's a difference. In Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This passage is all about salvation by grace. The verses just before this one insist that it is by grace that we are saved not by works. Paul is very careful that we know we cannot save ourselves by doing good deeds. But that doesn't mean that good works are optional. Good has prepared all kinds, sorry, God has prepared all kinds of good for us to do. We don't get to heaven by doing good, but if we're heaven bound, we're going to do good along the way. Amen? 
So let's go next to the book of Acts and a sermon Peter preached about Jesus. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. You can describe Jesus' time on earth as a time of doing good. In Acts 9.36, it describes one of Jesus' followers. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In the Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. So if you were this woman, how would you prefer to be known? Tabitha sure sounds better than Dorcas. Yeah. Yeah. But even better is she was known as someone who was always doing good. Someone who was always doing good. In Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You see, as followers of Jesus, we should never get tired of doing good things. God has good works planned out for us to do. Jesus went around doing good. Jesus' followers are known for always doing good. So as I think about the fruit of goodness that the Spirit wants to grow in our lives, I think about being people who do good things in the world. Goodness is something we do. We are called to be people of action, people who do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. We are not called to be do-gooders, as in busy bodies who are always sticking their noses where they don't belong but good doers, people who act in ways that are generous and helpful, caring and compassionate. But there's another passage we need to consider, a passage that tells us that our actions are connected to our hearts, a passage that says we cannot do good things unless we are good people. I'm thinking of Luke chapter 6. Verses 43 through 46. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a, a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briar. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. This passage is important for us to think about as we study the fruit of the Spirit because it uses the same metaphor. Jesus is saying that our lives are fruit trees and the fruit that we bear are the actions that we show, how we treat people, the words we speak. Just like you can tell what kind of fruit tree you have in by the fruit that it bears if a tree has apples then it's an apple tree if a tree has figs then it's a fig tree so you can tell what kind of person you have by their actions and their words if they show evidence of love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control then they are people who are being changed by the Holy Spirit You could call them holy trees. And if their fruit are not being produced, then you have something else. But notice what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that we cannot bear good fruit if our hearts are bad. A bad tree does not bear good fruit. And an evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. That doesn't mean that a non-Christian can never do good things. Adolf Hitler's favorite camera pose was with furry animals. And little children. 
Adi Amin used to cry when he heard sad stories. Joseph Stalin was kind to his daughters. Even the wicked know how to do good things. But Jesus is saying that if the heart is wrong, even our best deeds are still evil. If our hearts are wrong, then even our most selfless acts are corrupted by pride and selfishness and impure motives. Bad trees cannot bear good fruit. Not ultimately. And the opposite is also true. We cannot say that our hearts are good unless we are bearing good fruit. We cannot claim that we are Christians, that we are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, if the fruit of the Spirit is not evident in our lives. Specifically, as we talk about the fruit of goodness, we cannot say that we are good people unless we are doing good things. Our good deeds become one of the litmus tests of whether we are truly followers of Christ. As James says, faith without works is dead in James chapter 3. So I want to go back to my definition from earlier and add to it. I said that goodness is something we do. Now I want to add to it that it must grow out of what we are. We cannot do truly good things unless we are first good people. Bad trees will not produce good fruit. We must first be good trees. Now, hopefully, you're sensing a, a little bit of a problem here. Because biblically speaking, none of us are good. True, true. Amen? We might help the occasional cat down from a tree. We might make a random donation to a food bank. But those good deeds do not in and of themselves make us good. And so, as we've been saying throughout the study of the fruit of the Spirit, this is not something we can produce on our own. It is a fruit of the Spirit. We need Him to do His work in us. We can only grow the fruit of goodness as the Spirit makes it grow and ripen in our lives. Just, but just like the farmer who depends on God to make his seeds sprout and grow and produce a harvest, there are things we can do to cultivate that crop. While we cannot make goodness grow in our lives, we can tend the soil of our heart and pull the weeds in our lives that will give goodness a chance to thrive. With that in mind, I'd like us to turn to Psalm 15. You have a Bible with you? If you'd like to turn to Psalm 15. Psalm 15 isn't a passage that uses the word good or goodness, but I believe it gives a pretty good description of what a good person looks like. It's not a very long song, so let's read it together. Psalm 15. <clears throat> Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, and cast no slur on others. Who despises the vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord. Who keeps an oath, even when it hurts, and does not change their mind. Who lends money to the poor without interest. Who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Amen? <coughs> Now, some scholars believe this psalm may have been used by the pilgrims as they approached the tabernacle of the temple. The first verse, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent, implies that the psalm is about the kind of preparation that should be made before coming to worship. Others suggest that this is more of a wisdom psalm, talking about the ethics that should characterize the righteous person. Either way, what we end up with is a list of behaviors that describe the kind of person that God approves of. 
the kind of person who would be qualified to live on God's holy mountain. In the next four verses, then, I see at least six things that will describe a good person. So, if we want to cultivate goodness, I want to suggest these six things. First, live with integrity. Be the same person when no one is watching as you are when people are around. Verse 2, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous. The word blameless does not mean perfect, but rather a heart attitude that desires to please God. It's the kind of life that an observer would have a hard time finding fault with. It's a consistent life, a life that is free from double standards and hypocrisy. The second, speak honestly. Control your tongue. The last line of verse 2 and the first line of verse 3, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander? As we saw in Luke 6, what comes out of our mouth reveals a lot about what's going on in our hearts. A person who is cultivating the fruit of goodness will tame his or her tongue. That means telling the truth, not shading the truth, not spinning things so that we always come out looking good, not withholding information that might make us look bad. Goodness comes with a level of transparency. More than just telling more than just truth-telling, though, the good person is careful about other sins of the tongue. Gossip, insults, grumbling, profanity. All of these are things that the good person guards against. One translation of the first line of verse 3 says, He who does not trip over his tongue. I like that phrase. A person who is cultivating goodness is careful not to trip over his tongue. He doesn't let his tongue get him into trouble. Amen? The third thing to cultivate goodness, care for your neighbor. Look out for others. The last two lines in verse 3, who does no wrong to a neighbor, but casts no slur on others. The good person does not purposely hurt others, let alone a neighbor or a close friend. Neither does a good person participate in tearing down others. Do you know friends that do that? Casting a slur means to spread an evil word about someone, or even to listen while someone else speaks an evil word against a neighbor, to be a part of it. More than just refraining from wrong, I think goodness means helping your neighbor. It's following the example of the Good Samaritan. The good works that God has prepared for us to do include acts of generosity and kindness. It means going out of your way to serve someone else, sacrificing your time, treasure, and talent to make someone else's situation a little bit better. The fourth... No right from wrong. Discern between good and evil. Who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord? The Bible uses strong language here. We teach our kids not to use the word hate. We're not supposed to hate anyone. And the word despise seems even worse. Does God really want us to despise people? Well, the psalm uses an equally strong term to describe the person we should despise, a vile person. A vile person isn't just someone who doesn't know God, but someone who is so hardened in his or her sin that there would appear to be no hope of repentance or change. I don't think the Bible is saying that we should give up hope that those people will someday that those people will not someday be saved but we should show discernment in our association with them as the old saying goes 
Bad company corrupts good character. We should despise them in the sense that we keep our distance from their actions, that we are guarded in the influence we allow them to have in our lives. In other words, this is saying that a good person is wise in his or her choice of friends. They are people smart in their ability to recognize those who fear the Lord and those who thumb their nose up at him. The fifth thing, keep your promises. Be a person others can depend on. The second half of verse 4, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. A good person is a person of his or her word. When you make a promise, when you say you will do something, do it. Follow through. Even if it's hard. And the sixth thing, handle money well. Money. What do they say? The root of all evil? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Handle money well. How we handle money says much about our goodness. In verse 5, who lends money to the poor without an interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. This isn't a knock at bankers. Rather, it's a warning against economic injustice. The word translated as interest here is better translated as usury. That's the practice of the wealthy charging extremely high interest on loans made to those who had fallen on hard times. It was not unusual in the ancient Near East for interest rates of 50% to be used. Can you imagine that? This, of course, would ensure that the rich would get richer while those who were poor stayed poor. Likewise, the line about bribes against the innocent is a recognition that those who had money had an easier time finding favor in the courts. Judges and officials could be bribed to see things a certain way, which ensured that the rich found things going their way more often than not. And again, the poor suffered. A good person will use his or her money well. A good person will take care not to participate in economic systems that discriminate against those who have less. A good person will do their part for economic fairness. These are six ways then to cultivate goodness, integrity, honesty, care, discernment, dependability, and fairness. This is the kind of person who can dwell in the Lord's presence. Or, as the final verse of the psalm says, whoever does these things will never be shaken. Amen? Amen. This is how to be good. This is how to plant your feet on a firm foundation. Here's the key. Just like the fruit of the tree from Luke 6, a bad tree can't bear good fruit. But a bad heart cannot do good. So we need God to give us a new heart. We need him to grasp something new into our tree so that we can be good. So that we can do good. Goodness is action, and we as God's people are called to action, to be good, to do good, and to do God's will. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for your love for us and for your word that gives us wisdom and discernment and guidance and strength to be the people of God that you're calling us to be. We thank you for the gifts of the fruit of the Spirit that work tirelessly in us continue to develop us into your people. We love you and we thank you for walking beside us and for meeting us where we're at, but most of all for loving us so much that you would die on the cross and redeem us back to you. In your amazing and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.
May the Lord bless you.